what it was like, and, I mean, how he raised his daughter and how he was and was not part of the official literary scene, the language and the revolutionary language of the poets, but he was like not. Okay. Anyway, well, first, thank you very much for having me here for a second time. It's my second time in speculation, and uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's always uh, some of uh, these uh, fantastic venues. <laughs> I love this place also. <laughs> so, um, second, as usual, uh, excuse my English, sometimes uh, uh, maybe I wouldn't be able to make uh, myself understand very well. But uh, what I'm going to read today, at least a part of it, it was uh, previously published uh, as a short article, Experimental Biodystopia, in the Alienist uh, magazine, so it can be read at least partially from then. It's a short text uh, that involves a few uh, very uh, short fiction and then some uh, short essay. And uh, for coming here, I did a remix of this article with uh, some ideas that uh, came to my mind when I started to read a book uh, that just came out in Spanish from my friend, the Spanish writer um, Agustin Fernandez Mayo, which is uh, entitled uh, General Theory of Trash, Teoría General de la Basura in Spanish. So. Uh, so let's go straight into your true sexual organ, the brain, with tiny waves, gold nanowires, and synthetic viruses for fully automated satisfaction. That's abstract neurofucking, artificial fractal or bone fit forwarding the full madness of anonymous love. Disregard conventional sensory stimulation, forget skin, genitals, gestures, body shapes, Exclude any link to reproductive functions. This is the real thing, pure fuckable noumena, completely devoid of sensory organ mediatization. There's nothing virtual in our system. It actually allows you to factor out any given virtuality, every bit of, represent of representational sensory information. In our app, you could select whatever inter interaction level you might want, from chatting and exchanging pictures or videos to sharing no data with potential stimulators. You could set it to random mode and receive stimulation proposals for any anonymous source. Human status cannot be granted in the network. Of course, every process could be interrupted at any moment. The access to hive to uh, hive pleasure areas of your of your Wi-Fi brain will be always protected by a secure encryption. So you will decide if you wish to exchange your access data or to block any undesired interaction. Interaction. You will be able to accept or re reject the stimulation at your will. Hacking will be considered rape. This is just an example. This is the fiction part. Uh, resonant uh, biosocial architectonics are produced by desire processing, a statistically driven computation. Orderly utopian and orderly dystopian future presents become fused in a mashup of consumption dialectics, where a future that, wa that was once dark and hopeless is now dark and beautiful when one dives headlong into it. Late capitalism is inflationary. It's a computer that processes desire. So let's forget about desire and instead address pleasure as an unmediated and networked commodity. Techno-utopia is only conceivable if assuming that any given computational process is actually the consequence of a conscious a priori programming that further processes and optimizes some naturally transcendental bio-propensities. Understanding bios as a mere taxonomy of forms and functions, acting as a set of morphogenetic constraints and developing into proper pleasure architectonics. Techno-utopia is only understandable if the utopos is prefeatured as a foundational part of the human biological essence, instead of, for instance, thinking about randomized desire production 
pleasure induction as a blind, spontaneous process within the capitalist machine. Computing as the automatic production of random and anthropic processes that would be or not accepted by humans or non-humans calls for a different perspective than thinking about it as techno matchmaking between human desires and products imagined to fulfill those desires. The classical economicist informational way. While conventional informative utopia dystopia becomes the, envir uh, the environment for desire fulfillment within a framework of, of uh, foreseeable continuity, BIOS then understood as a will to replicate or to increase information and complexity across a linear time, the fictional space of experimental dystopia offers an unformational environment for acceptation where unthinkable, illegitimate or perverse desires could be co-opted and repurposed. A speculative non-biology explores the, explores the an architecture of matter swirling in a disorder and chaos, reversibly moving from non-life to life and vice versa. Bills as a process without beginning, end or purpose, crash life, which might reflect matter on its way to exploring possibilities of existence in deorganized time patches, when orderly morphogenesis would be provisionally uh, piloted by the cosmos as a temporary tool to move di directionless across planes of consistency or quantum fields. There will be nothing properly alive or no properly human thing. Biopaced socio-political categories would not be understood as biological constraints, biological rights, or even biological targets or expectations anymore, no matter their frequency or of occurrence in a population but instead they will be considered as manipulable, a manipulable performing data, the contingent results of xeno crypto nano technological appropriation. Modern images of the human and their political implications are closely related to the resonant biosocial definitions. Human's biological activity, uh, sorry, ability to participate in social practices and to be biological shaped by them. Nevertheless, recent developments in speculative biology, including the recycling of previously discarded hypotheses such as panspermia, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment, uh, biotechnology and computer sciences are questioning the traditional boundaries of conventional biology-based humanism. Bio-based categories such as ethnicity, gender, age, paternity or subjectivity cannot be understood anymore as biological constraints or biological rights, but as implied by xenofeminist, bio-speculative and unconditional accelerationist proposals as manipulable data. The contingent results of technological human or inhuman operation. As David, Ro uh, David Roden states, Gotting Molear, humans will be taken in body in their generic materiality, rather than as a defined species of thoughtful inner animals. Behavior integrates everyone into the real equally. The well uh, concept of the force of thought, Rodin explains, challenges us to consider whether the actions of the rational subject of discourse can be delimited by reasons rather than as the effects of an, an object, objectifiable real. Performance not as an act, but as an effect of the real as human. Every scientific investigation is a priori limited by the cultural normative environment in which it develops. The current bio representation of the human is thus borne by modernity's cultural constraint, ignoring or marginalizing what we could denominate the occult, the occult branched areas and adjacent possibles, those that are not approachable by strictly scientific methods. 
uh, not statistically predictable, yet representable by material metaphors. An occult-inspired, non-biocentric anthropological approach could help us to sketch a political definition of a poetical sorry definition of non-biology, in an attempt to, in to integrate current scientific knowledge with the speculative technical practices. Non-biology then wouldn't just reflect an openness to inorganic life, but first and foremost, it would represent the quest for a different understanding of, of what the bios is. David Roden again wrote, post-human bodies are consequently the formations or proformations of the human biomorphism, uh, biomorphism, and biomorphs are speculative or critical bodies, experiments in unliving. Posthumanism, unbound, provides a speculative deployment of life without limiting it with any vitalist distinction between life and matter or mechanism. It is a conceptual abattoir. The posthuman is perverse to its core. It does not give us an ethical purchase. Its notion of life is so generic, empty and anti anti teleological, counter final, that it cannot tell us either what life is or what we, this is any living collective, should become. It makes no philosophical decisions, including ethical ones. It biomorphizes ethics but by making forms of, of existence, uh, whether through capitalist or non-capitalist means. In this sense, perhaps, posthumanism is an expression of the technological logic of modernity, including capitalist modernity as a variant of non-philosophy. As the, uh, all this is quote uh, by David Rodin. Third part. In his recent essay book, A General Theory of Trust, Agustin Fernandez Mayo introduces his proposal of a complex realism with two examples. The first example is one of the most important philosophical questions in my life, which is how the fact does a dinosaur look like? <laughs> so this is a, a, a drawing of a dinosaur from the uh, 19th century. When I was a kid, I had a wonderful book by, uh, with um, drawings by Burian. Uh, and uh, this was uh, how a uh, Tyrannosaur Rex looked uh, then, when I was 10 years old. I mean, the, the image is, is from the 30s, but this was the kind of book that I could have when I, had a, when I, when I was a kid. So uh, I think most dinosaurs look like that then. And uh, this is how dinosaurs look like. In the, 21st century, the first, uh, I mean, the, the upper one is uh, from one of the um, of the movies, of the yeah, Jurassic Park movies. And uh, the lower one is one of the most recent uh, drawings uh, when uh, we started, well, they started to think that dinosaurs may have feathers. Well, uh, Agustin starts the book uh, thinking about that. Uh, how is a dinosaur? An another important uh, thing that he, he asks also, uh, how do we pronounce a dead language? How, how would, uh, do we pronounce, how do, you, how do we know how uh, Latin sounded, or classic Greek sounded, or Aramaic sounded? We don't know. We don't have any record of how these languages were pronounced. So the idea he develops, well, <clears throat> let me show you first some uh, more pictures. <laughs> this is by uh, a recent uh, also uh, artist, uh, I think, uh, I don't know where he's from, he's European, but I'm not, I'm not sure. And this is a drawing of a baboon, uh, uh, drawn from the bones, the way we draw the dinosaurs. So he was thinking, well, how would uh, uh, current animals look like if we thought about them like dinosaurs? This is a baboon. 
and as thou shalt find it. <laughs> well, the idea about that is that in any science, both uh, uh, biological sciences or theoretical sciences or uh, human sciences, there is a part with hard knowledge and there is a part with, uh, that is soft knowledge. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, hard knowledge in, in this case would be the bones of the dinosaur, things that we can uh, measure, that we can photograph, that we can uh, work with it and reproduce anyway. And uh, soft knowledge is a collective of, or, uh, but all, always subjective interpretation of data. And this happens in any science. Uh, one uh, very interesting thing that is happening recently is that even in the hardest science, and this all, uh, always happened in physics, because physics, at least some physics, uh, theoretical phys physics, has always been spe speculative. But uh, in the biological sciences, being uh, speculative was completely forbidden. So uh, it was very funny when, the, in the last years, I started to find a lot of, of papers published in very important uh, uh, journals about speculative biology. For instance, <coughs> are, octopus, are octopuses aliens? Mm -hmm. This is a serious paper. I mean, it's not something that uh, appeared in one of these uh, uh, weird magazines, but it's published in the uh, Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology, very recently. And it's a very long paper trying to discuss if uh, actually uh, octopuses uh, appeared uh, on, on the sea because some alien viruses uh, arrived to Earth. This is panspermia. As I said, this is a theory that was uh, uh, completely abandoned uh, in the 30s, in the 1930s, or something like that. This is coming back. So uh, those viruses inf infected uh, whatever, I mean squids or whatever, and this turned them into uh, octopuses. Is love all your brain needs? fMRI as love detector. I love talking about those things because this is my field. I mean, it's neuroscience, and neuroscience is so full of bullshit all the time. <laughs> Especially fMRI is completely full of bullshit. Most fMRI papers, uh, only clinical papers are good, but uh, everything, uh, all those things that trying to explain how the brain works and you know all cognitive neuroscience. Uh, done ex exclusively with uh, imaging systems are mostly bullshit. So, uh, in all those cases, uh, it's the same. We're having a hard knowledge. I mean, we're having a hard knowledge here. Oh, sorry. We're having a hard knowledge here. We have, uh, we have a very hard and expensive technology and a lot of soft knowledge. How we interpret it, uh, are interpreting uh, the data that we are receiving. Uh, actually, in the case of neuroscience, we didn't change much in the last uh, like 150 years. Uh, I mean, they would kill me if they were a neuroscientist in the, in the room, but that's true. I mean, we have a very sophisticated technology, but we are still uh, doing things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is Carrington in 21 and uh, is trying to photograph the sowel. And this is a phrenology, uh, phrenology chart from the uh, uh, late uh, 19th century, and it's difficult to see from here. But uh, all those things are pictures explaining what every part of the brain does. The same. They had some hard uh, knowledge. They had knowledge from lesions, they had knowledge from uh, surgery, etc. And they had uh, soft knowledge. The soft knowledge, the metaphors are the same uh, for phrenology charts and from most uh, fMRI studies. Another, another example, with, this is very, a uh, very funny one, it's very recent, I found it in a, in a blog uh, about science and neuroscience, and um, this is not in a, such a good uh, 
journal, but it's a scientific journal anyway, uh, I call it Televinesis, is a water, wine, and the sacred, an anthropological view of substances altered by intentioned awareness, including objective and aesthetic effects. So they are trying, they, they have uh, two uh, groups of people, and uh, they open some bottles of wine, and for, uh, uh, in, in one of those bottles of wine, there is someone that is like fixating for a while. He, he doesn't touch the wine, he just uh, tr tries to transmit to uh, some telepathy to the wine. And then uh, they give the wine to try to several, to different groups of, of people. And statistic statistically, it's shown that the wine that had this energy from uh, whoever uh, is preferred is better, so I, I suggest we should uh, try to do that tonight <laughs> for instance, and see who has more power of televinesis. <laughs> and the last one is referred to the what I was telling about the, uh, the how uh, would a dead language sound, so how does it sound to be Pythagoras, for instance. We know that we have this hard knowledge and we have this soft knowledge. Well, okay. uh, well, I put this image, uh, uh, this image uh, to insist. There are hard sciences and soft sciences. This is wrong. There is hard knowledge and soft knowledge in any science. <clears throat> so what is hard knowledge? Repro uh, reproducible, re reducible, falsable, same cause, uh, produces the same effect, is sets of empirically, uh, empirically coherent abstract, abstract rules, matrix, framework, base network, scaffolds, fractality, quantum fields, all this is part of the hard knowledge. It is that, uh, it, and, uh, very, very important is uh, databaseable, you can, you can put it in a database, and it has a risk that is statistically accountable, which is very important, especially for economics, so it's very good. Uh, uh, you can uh, um, uh, easily transform into, into something very utilitarian. Soft knowledge, however, is not reducible, not falsable, speculative, performative, and I would uh, um, introduce here the species of possibilities, narrative processes, non-stable states of the system, uh, systems that are changing all the time, so they cannot be uh, precisely measured. This is also basic physics, but uh, it happens with any system uh, whenever we observe it. It's a narrative and abstract performance. Uh, its risk is not statistically accountable, and uh, a good definition is forms of existence. So, uh, going back to biology, we can think in three different ways about how do we, do we explain living things and also human things. The first one, which is uh, materialism, reductionist materialism, which is very prevalent in, in biological sciences in, in general, is that all phenomena in all living beings are biological, therefore, they might, they might be explained by biology alone. And including, um, uh, putting a note, uh, of course, bio biological means physical, chemical, exactly, uh, or all those things that uh, happen in, in living things. A second position, which is a more metaphysical position, would be some non-biological uh, uh, phenomena occur in some living beings that cannot be explained by biology alone. But a third possibility, which is uh, what I would call speculative materialism, and uh, Fernandez Mayo calls complex realism, is that all phenomena in all living beings are biological, but however, not of them could be explained by biology alone. We need the soft knowledge coming from everywhere. So to finish, at the end of Alex Garland's movie, Annihilation, uh, have you seen the movie? It's a wonderful movie. Yeah. Uh, Natalie Portman's character is asked why the Sheba, a mis mysterious 
ailing energy field that is seen in the first. Uh, this is the shimmer. It's destroying everything. It's not destroying, she answers. It's making something new. This is not another metaphor for creative destruction, but playing with the idea that a different end of the world is possible. Ugliness becomes thrilling and alienation becomes adventure. Why should the laws of nature care about what I find beautiful? asked the theoretical physicist Sabine Hofstede. Indeed, we look for horror physics to find a non-biology as a multidimensional object performance. Because the occult is not just an unknown or something from the past not fully identified, as in our ignorance of the aspect of the dinosaur or the impossibility to correctly pronounce a spelling Aramaic, or from the future, like a time-reversing hyperstitional entity. But it's actually the acknowledgement of otherness performing here and now. The cult would be the space of unknown performances happening in the world. Not my performance, not human performance, not the performance of life, but the pure intuition that some other is performing. That some other could be identified with capitalism, as Nick Land does, or with an alien force like in annihilation. But we can't approach, approach the, the unknown with epistemological instruments. We cannot try, uh, just try to transform the cult into knowledge. We cannot desire the unknown. The only possible approach to the occult is an abject poiesis which includes the most unimaginable ways, taking advantage of our hard and soft knowledge derived technologies of thinking and acting to do our own thing, expecting some effect with no cause, some kind of quantum entanglement with portions of the unknown. And that's all. Thank you very much.